Um, hello, everybody. I'm Patrick. And uh, my talk today is Parallelism in Perl 6. So I will do an overview for the talk. I have no idea how long this talk will actually be. Um, I thought about like cloning myself and giving each version in parallel, but um, the cloning technology uh, Carl's uh, future self didn't bring back with him from the future. So uh, uh, we will do it sequentially. Um, uh, first of all, I'm giving a talk on parallelism, and I will be the first to tell you I am not an expert on threading or parallelism. I'm giving this talk because it's a talk that needs to be given, not because I know anything about the subject. Um, in fact, I have yet to write a threaded application in Perl, ever. I've been writing Perl code for over 22 years now, and I've yet to do threading. I have done fork. Um, I have used pipes. I even did, I even sent a signal once in Perl. Um, but, Me too. Uh, <laughs> oh, he got a microphone. Okay, good. So uh, uh, Larry Larry will be helping me throughout the uh, talk because he he knows more of what is supposed to be there than I do. Um, that's but, what you uh, think. Yeah. Um, so that is uh, uh, that's the background. So you know, if you go through and say, well, what do you think of the blah 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 threading model that is being used by uh, you know this other application? I'm going to have no clue. Uh, I will tell you now. But I do know a little bit about the, uh, Perl 6. And so when it comes to threading in Perl 6, uh, having been the Recruto Pump King for several years, I would say that when we go to talk about Perl 6, one of the most frequently asked questions I get besides when will 1.0 be released and when will it be finished is parallelism in Perl 6. What threading model will Perl 6 use? And I don't know anything about threading models, so I say there will be one. Um, and how does it work in Perl 6? And I'd like to be able to go say, read the synopses, but they're kind of slushy. Uh, and I'll explain what that means in a bit. Um, and they'll say, when will the threading design be finished? And I went through this for a couple of years, or a little over a year, and finally I decided I needed a better answer. And so the answer I came up with is, well, we on the design team don't really know what threading in Perl is going to look, Perl 6 is going to look like. So we're looking for people to come and explore the space so that they will tell us what works and what doesn't, and then we'll put it in the spec. And that kind of worked. And so, you know, we'll get some feedback um, and so forth. And maybe they can be done with modules and prototyped that way. And um, there are some built-in threading cons uh, constructs and blah, 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 blah. You start just mumbling it away. And that's not really a satisfactory either answer either. So I wanted to come up with a still better one. Now, last summer, uh, we had the Pearl Reunification Summit in August of last year. It was great fun. Uh, thank you to Liz and Wendy for uh, hosting that and putting that together for us. And during the summit, um, a lot of the Pearl 5 folks who uh, were there to talk um, said, you know, one of the features about Perl 6 we're really interested in is its support for parallelism. And um, so would, you know, could somebody please explain to us how parallelism in Perl 6 works? And my uh, standard answer didn't feel like it was going to work then. And so uh, I, I quickly improved a talk with the stuff I knew off the top of my head. And what I quickly realized in improving that talk is that it would really help to just catalog what we already know. And that that ought to be a talk. And so when it came time to put a talk together for EAPSI North America, I said, I'm going to do the parallelism talk. Even though I don't know anything about it, this will be a chance to go and read up on it and at least uh, categorize kind of what we already know. Now you're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only the expert on Perl 6 parallelism constructs, <laughs> not on threading. <laughs> So here's the current status. So uh, throughout Perl 6's design, I'm told that parallelism has been considered at many points of it. And I went back and reread the spec, and I did an ACK for parallel, and all of a sudden, all these paragraphs came up. And it's like, it really is in the design. How about that? Um, the overall approach, how everything's going to work, that's still a little slushy. And what I mean by slushy is that when we're talking about the Perl 6 specification, we tend to think of things as being frozen, um, you know, solid, frozen, um, a little bit damp, slushy, and nobody has any idea, so it just spills out all over the floor. Um, so this one's actually not even a little slushy, it's a lot slushy. Uh, it needs a lot of uh, exploration. 
Um, of the Perl 6 implementations that exist, few of them have any support for parallelism built in in the actual implementation. So they'll support the features that Perl 6 describes, but they're not actually parallel on, underneath. Um, in Rakuto's case, we've uh, been hampered by the fact that the virtual machine we use, Parrot, hasn't had good threading implementation that we felt we could use. Or if it had a good threading implementation, nobody working on the team understood it well enough to be able to use it. So uh, there was a problem there. Um, so as I go through the talk, I'm going to show some examples of some code, and almost none of them actually work in practice today. Or if they do work, meaning if you type them in and they give you the answer that, they were, uh, that you expected, they work by doing it sequentially. So we need some more examples and use cases to progress on this. So here's some basics. Um, some basic definitions, some basic starting points. So throughout this talk and in the Perl 6 spec, when we talk about a thread, we're not talking about a specific type of thread. We're not talking about a particular model. We're just talking about this generic notion that we have some sort of a process or a procedure or a function or something, and it can en execute in its own independent context, and there can be others of them happening at the same time, concurrently. Okay, so that's all that I mean by thread throughout this talk. Um, there are some design goals that have been built into the Perl 6 specification, and you see that throughout the specification uh, for parallelism. Um, one of them is just uh, that parallelism is hard. If there's one thing that I know to be true, when I was a graduate student in the mid-1980s, um, and everybody said, what is the future of computing? They said, it's going to be parallel computing. You know, in about a decade or so, we'll be able to write programs that run on multi-core systems and everything will just work magically. And then a decade later, as I was a professor in computer science, and I would go and hear about people talking about the future of computing, oh, in the 2000s, we'll do parallel processing and, you know, your programs will just naturally uh, parallelize and everything like that. Guess what? It hasn't happened yet. It um, happened in a parallel universe. In a <laughs> <laughs> so, um... Uh, Perl 6, one of its goals is to make that actually possible. Um, so you want to allow the compiler to figure out when it's possible to do parallel things, and you want to make it possible for the programmer to easily tell the compiler, hey, this can be done in parallel. Uh, you don't want it to have a lot of overhead, either in terms of execution or in terms of cognitive ability or cognitive thinking on the part of the programmer. So we'll provide some constructs to do that. The other thing that you have to do is you have to make sure you don't make any decisions in your design that inherently prevent parallelism from taking place. So let me give you an example of a decision, a design decision, where it's being driven by the need to avoid um, parallelism from being done. So then that's called failure. So in Perl 6, pa failure is not an option, it's mandatory. All right? <laughs> It's a specified requirement. There is a failure class in um, Perl 6. And this is the way that we return values where we say something went wrong. Now, in most languages, you throw an exception. But you don't always want to throw an exception, because if you're busy working on something, like flying a missile from one place to another, oh, I'm not on the network. Darn it. You would have seen a, uh, I feel like I'm using Keynote. Um, <laughs> <coughs> if, uh, you can see it's trying to load it. Um, if there was a missile blowing up spectacularly here, and it didn't work. I <laughs> <laughs> do you, uh, you have more of those that you want from the network? No, 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 no. Okay. No, that's, that's the only one. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, it's particularly important that, uh, so if, you're, if your missile is flying along and you're doing a bunch of calculations in parallel and one of them has a sign bit error or something you didn't do, you don't want your missile to suddenly throw an exception and stop running the entire program uh, just because of something like that taking place. So we, we do and we want what's called a soft failure. And so here's an example of a soft failure in Perl 6, so I'm declaring a variable and setting it to zero, and then I'm creating another value and dividing that value by zero, and I did it as a variable because I didn't want the constant folder to get a hold of it before um, I was ready for it. And in Perl 6, if you do this, um, it doesn't throw an exception right away. So that uh, when I get to the say statement there, it actually will say I'm still alive, even though we just divided by zero, and now have entered a parallel universe. <laughs> So the next question, of course, is, well, what's in value? 
What could possibly be there? And so we can ask. We can say, what is in value? And if we ask, what kind of thing are you? It comes back and it tells you, I'm a failure object. And in that failure object is the actual exception that would have been thrown. Um, had we been throwing exceptions at that particular point, but it, um, it, we haven't actually done anything. So it's okay to return a failure, and it just kind of passively sits there until you try and do something with it. So as soon as I say the value, or try and use it in another context, then it comes up and says, aha, I'm a failure. So just by the, the, um, the act of doing something that would cause an exception doesn't cause it to be immediately thrown. It can be deferred and it can be detected without having to do a try catch block. You can, do, you know, you, you don't have to put a try catch or anything like that. It's just natural part of the language. Perl six is very lazy. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. All right. Um, speaking of failure, having been on this topic, in Recuto 2013.05, that example I just gave you doesn't work. And I didn't know it doesn't work. It used to work. Somebody has gone and changed the way that the div thing is done. And you'll see here it didn't say alive like it was supposed to. It actually threw an exception immediately. And I was kind of uh, disappointed by that. Um, and the same is true for uh, um, floating point values. So I was kind of upset by that. So right now, for any of you that are on IRC, if you happen to be on the Perl 6 channel, you probably see this. <laughs> 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 He's working on it now. <laughs> okay, so that's what we mean by soft failure, and that's what we mean when we say don't design or don't put things in the language that are going to prevent parallelism from even taking place or that are going to make it hard to do. So here are some of the known parallel constructs that I could find in Perl 6 by either past experience or reading the synopses and things like that. There are probably more, um, but this is more than enough for my 45-minute talk. So hyperoperators, junctions, feeds, hyper and race, um, async, event streams, and signal handler handlers. So I'll start with hyperoperators because they're kind of the easy ones to see how it would work and where we're going with this. It's embarrassingly parallel. Yes. So in Perl 5, um, we have, um, if, you wanted to, if you had two arrays, uh, at A and at B, and you wanted to pairwise add the elements together to produce another array C, then you could do something like this. So you could loop through all of the elements of A um, and all of the elements of B, pairwise add them, and store the result in C. In Perl 6, we have a nice, uh, easier way to do that, and it's called a hyperoperator. So the way the hyperoperator works is it's a meta operator that's placed around another operator, like an infix operator, a method call, a prefix operator, any of those kinds of things. So by putting these little French angle back brackets around them, um, around the plus sign, what we've done is take what was originally a scalar operator and turned it into a list operator where the lists on either side are now going to be operated on in parallel. So this says take all of the elements of A and for each element find a corresponding element in B, add them together and put that in the corresponding place in C. Okay, it's really, really cool. It's much nicer to write something like this than to write all of this up here. Um, and if you've used uh, PDL, uh, the Perl data language, then you know that you can do similar types of things there. This just has it baked in into Perl 6. Now, of course, the question I usually get at this point is, uh, you know, what are those characters uh, that are actually there? They're, of course, the French angle brackets. Um, if you don't have uh, light typing in the Latin 1 character set and doing things, then you can, of course, use the other version, which is appropriate because they are called the Texas. <laughs> angle brackets because everything's bigger in Texas. Eha. <laughs> so then you just do it that way. All right, so that's there. Now, um, you can do that on unary operators. You can see if you wanted to increment every element in the array XYZ, you just do plus plus on XYZ. Um, you can do it on any infix operator. So this is actually going to pairwise do the min function between all the elements of A and B. So uh, X is going to end up with the smaller of A and B in each one. There's a whole bunch of stuff dealing with hyperators, hyper operators that you can go read about in the synopses. That's not important to what I'm wanting to look at, which is parallelism. When you use a hyper operator in Perl 6, you are explicitly telling the compiler this is a parallelizable operation. There are no uh, side effects that you need to worry about between the elements and doing all of these. 
If you want to go through and you have 100 elements and you want to pass it to your 100 core processor and let each one of them do one element at a time, go ahead and do that. It's safe to do. And now the optimizer can get a hold of it and it can say, aha, this is a parallelizable operation. Um, they don't have to be done sequentially. There aren't any side effects that I need to worry about. Um, so just you know, go at it. You know, start uh, uh, spawning off threads to be able to go and process that however efficiently that the optimizer thinks that can best be done. Um, so the nodes can be visited in any order. There's no interactions. And this is also saying you can look for other optimizations here. If A and B happen to both be arrays of compact integers, of native integers, maybe you want to throw it over to the, the GPU um, that you have there, the you know a side processor or something, and let it just go right at it and give you the result back. Um, so there's other types of optimizations that can be there. If you want to know more about hyperoperators, see Synopsis 3. A interesting side note that I noticed while putting this talk together is that all of those features of parallelism that I sh uh, listed above, each one is in a separate synopsis. <laughs> So next is junctions. Any questions on the hyperoperators before I go? Or any comments that you wanted to add, Larry? It's embarrassing that they're in separate synopses. Yeah, I know. I was, I was like, that was kind of shocking to me, but they are all over the place. It shows you how organized my mind isn't. <laughs> Okay, so next is um, hyperoperator. Uh, that was hyperoperators. Okay, junctions. So a junction is a single value that's equivalent to multiple values. If you've ever seen Damian Conway give his superpositions talk, this is it in Perl 6. Um, so here I have a junction which consists of the values 1 or 2 or 3. And if I add 4 to that, then I get the values 5 or 6 or 7. It's not an array. It's not a list. It's a single um, item that is holding several values simultaneously. Now, there are different types of junctions. So each junction has a type. They are any, all, one, or none. And we can use them for some really nice natural uh, programming. So if I say I have a roll of a dice, and, or something that was supposedly the roll of a die, and uh, I want to know if it's in the range one to six, I can just say if the roll is equal to any of one through six. And that tests to see if the roll is any of one through six. Or I can say, and this works in Perl 6 just fine, if the roll is equal to one, two, or three, print the words low roll. Um, I can check to see if an element is in an array by simply saying if none of the elements in A are equal to LM. And that's all done by junctions. Okay, again, there's a lot of other things that we can do with junctions, but I'm looking at the parallel aspect. Oh, wait, so here's some nice. Uh, Here's some nice uh, uh, other things that you can do. So with junctions, I can say if any of the values in list one are also in list two. Or if all of the values in list one are in list two. Or if none of the values in list one are in list two. You can just do that directly, and it kind of does the right thing. From a parallelizability point of view, if we have an expression like this, so I'm asking, is A numerically equal to anything in list? What happens internally is that there's a junction dispatcher. It looks at the um, sides of the equals and it says, oh, well, that's a scalar of some sort. And this other side's a junction. And because it's a junction, it goes to a special type of dispatch, which I'll call the junction dispatcher. And what that does is it, it distributes the operation over the values that are in the junction. So since this is an any junction, and this is the equal equal operator, what the dispatcher does is it tests um, equal equal for, uh, against the first element, against the second element, against the third element, and so forth. And what you would get back is an any junction where the values are true or false, depending on whether it was true or false for each one of the pairwise things. But it's parallelizable, because these things can be done independently. That's part of what junctions promise to be able to do it. So I can take each one of those and thread it out. So if there's a hundred or a thousand of them, I can put each of those equal equal operators among multiple threads and let them go and do the work in parallel and then just compose the results back into a junction when I'm done. We don't, but we could. Right. We don't do it yet. Okay. Kind of see how that works? And it, it distributes over multiple operations. It's really, really cool the way it does that. There's also a further optimization that could be done here. Um, so once I have something like this, and again, this is actually being done dynamically. It's not something that anybody would actually write. Uh, for an any junction, if you're in a Boolean context, as soon as one of those 
equations, one of those tests comes back with true, you can stop. You don't have to go do anything more. You can short circuit because you know that the Boolean value of the any is going to be true because at least one was true. So you can do that for almost all of the different type of types of junctions. So in an any junction, um, if any true is found, you're done. In a none junction, if any true is found, you're done, but you're done the other way. It's like, nope, at least one was true. For an all of them, you can short circuit as soon as you find one that wasn't true. And for a one junction, you can short circuit as soon as you find more than one that was true. So uh, it's really, really handy to be able to do that. So when you do something like uh, these examples that I had here, not only is it easier to write, but it would be automatically threaded to do that test and do it for you quickly if the optimizer decides that it's appropriate to do it at that point. Any questions on junctions? Synopsis 9. Okay, next is feeds. So feeds are created using the arrow operators or the feed operators, and they're done with two equal signs and an angle bracket of some sort. So what a feed is, is it's a way of taking data and making something that looks like a pipeline in Perl 6. Now, of course, if you're Unix, you know that pipes are done with the vertical bar, which is so commonly used for pipes that we just call it the pipe character. Um, but that already means something else in Perl 6. So we have this longer thing, and it helps to do it out anyway. So what this is <clears throat> doing is it's taking take all the elements of data and find all of the ones that are odd. And you can write it either way. You can say, take all the elements of data and find all the ones that are odd. And so that's going to actually produce that. Um, those two um, statements are, are equivalent to saying grep of this with data. And somebody will say, well, why don't you just write the grep? And where it becomes powerful is when you start to put several things together. So here I'm taking a set of numbers, I'm finding the odd ones, I'm sorting the results, um, then I'm mapping it to their squares, and I'm storing it in an array called odd squares. So it just is. Um, putting them through all of these operations, like a pipeline, where each element is just producing a list of elements to be consumed by the next element um, until we get to the end and we store it somewhere. And so all of this is equivalent to this, but this kind of lets you see exactly what's happening in the process. Any question on feeds before I go? So how does it become parallel? Well, it's like a pipeline. And the way Unix pipes work, of course, is when you create a pipeline, it generally spawns off a separate process for each component of the pipeline. The same thing is true in Perl 6. When you use this operator, when you use the arrows, you are saying that the arguments, um, the statements, the parts of the arrows that are producing values uh, can be treated as closures that execute in parallel with their receivers. It's explicitly saying these two things can go in parallel. Um, not only that, but it's lazy. So it acts like a per Unix pipeline. It doesn't, I mean, they don't have to be lazy, but uh, generally what's going to happen is that odd squares here is going to request values from map, which is going to request values from sort, which is going to request values from grep, which will then grab them from nums, and it'll do so lazily. But if you want to do a push model, as Jonathan did in his talk yesterday, um, then you could just say nums starts shooting things into an array till it fill, or into a list until it kind of fills up, and then grab, grab, grep grabs them from them. So you could go from either way. Um, and not only that, but if there are any lexical variables that are used here that kind of uh, go beyond their scopes or their closures, then the compiler is to analyze that and do any uh, locking or transaction protection that it needs to do on each of those variables um, so that you don't have to worry about shared variables causing problems. It's supposed to put that locking in place. So again, lots of parallelism in a form that is what the programmer wanted to be able to ex express in the first place. Synopsis 6. Any questions on feeds? How much time do I have? 25 minutes. Oh, wow, I'm going fast. OK. I got lots of questions on feeds, but nobody knows the answers. <laughs> All right, uh, parallel list generators. Uh, Perl 6 has lazy lists. The laziness is built into lists. And so generators represent the lazy portion of the list internally. So here I have a statement that is taking results. And what I'm doing is reading from data. And for each element, I'm going to print it to the output and then multiply it by two. And that's what gets returned and put into results. Okay, So that's there. Um, 
Uh, I will call attention to the fact that I'm doing a bind instead of an assignment here, and that's because assignment, array assignment is naturally eager, and I wanted this to be lazy. So when this statement is executed, what will be displayed on the screen? Nothing, All right? Unless it happens to be in scene context, but let's don't go there. All right, um, so nothing will be uh, displayed on the screen at this particular point because map is lazy. All I did was define the generator that is going to be used to produce this array, but we haven't actually generated anything yet. Okay. So um, uh, nothing's output yet, so then you say, well, how do you use it? If I go and ask for something from the results array, so for example, if I ask for element uh, at position two in the, um, in the array, then it will say, oh, I need to go generate some elements. So uh, it will go and execute the map closure three times to get element zero, one, and two. And it will read from data, and then the zero or whatever values are in data, the first three values would end up being uh, printed because of the say that's here. And then results, the first three elements would be filled in with the values of the first three elements of data multiplied by two, okay? So that's, uh, that is laziness uh, at work. Then if I go and do something like say, I wanna know how many elements there are, the total number, by asking for the number of elements in this particular array, that's actually going to consume the rest of the array. Uh, because in order to find out how many elements that you, there are, you have to get rid of all, you have to take all the generators out, unless, unless you can detect that it's infinite somehow. Um, so this would go through the remaining values of data, and every value of data would be displayed because of the dot say in the order it appears in the data array, and it would multiply it by two and stick that in results. Okay, so that's basic lazy lists in Perl 6. Sometimes you don't want to wait. Sometimes you have a list or an array and you want to say, please generate everything that I need. And for that, we have the eager uh, prefix. And so here's the example I just gave for results where it's lazy. If you wanted to go ahead and get all of the values for something that you believe to otherwise be lazy, you just prefix it with eager. So here I put the word eager there, and that causes the list that comes after it to be evaluated eagerly. So in, when this statement is executed, all of the elements will be said at that particular point because we will go through the map and exhaust all of the elements of data and store them into results um, before this statement finishes, and that's what the eager does. Okay, that's still sequential, but I wanted to throw eager in there because this is the appropriate place to do it. Um, so that's eager. There's another form that's called hyper. And it has the same kind of connotation as with the hyper operators, but this one is for lazy lists. So if you put a hyper prefix instead of eager, then what you're telling the um, program is that I want you to go ahead and eagerly evaluate the values, and I don't care what order you do it in as long as you give them back to me in the same order that you would have when it was done sequentially. And so at this point, um, when we say hypermap and do all of this uh, work here, it's going to eagerly evaluate this map, causing all the elements to be done, but the map can tell, oh, I'm being hyperly evaluated. So I don't have to wait for the previous block to finish before I can start the next one. I can go ahead and start uh, several of them in parallel and be processing them in parallel. And the one thing I do have to be sure of is that as the elements come back, I put them back in the sequence they would have been had it been sequential. But now you can get, just by saying hyper in front, you can get things to happen um, faster uh, for a lazy list. Now, if there are side effects, when you use hyper, you're basically telling the system you don't care about side effects. So if you put side effects in there, you get what you asked for. And if you didn't put side effects in there, then you're fine, okay? So in this case, say is a side effect. So because it's a side effect and they're being executed in some arbitrary order, the elements of data, all of them will be printed out, but we don't know what order they're going to be in. You can't predict that. Um, yes, I we should can. mention- It'll be a random order. Uh, I predict it will be a random order. I, Andy predicts it'll be a random order. I predict it'll be whatever the optimizer chooses to do. <laughs> because the optimizer may look at it and say, oh, Fastest is to do it sequentially. Yeah. So uh, it will be there. Now, uh, I should mention that what Recuto does uh, for the hypers, uh, whenever you use them, is it actually randomizes the order that it does them in, even though it's not parallel. 
because I don't want people to use the hypers and assume that it will always be sequential, even though it's effectively doing it sequential. So as an example of that, um, so if I have a list of elements, let's see, I can do zero, dot, dot, nine, um, well, let's do it this way, my a equals uh, zero, dot, dot, nine, right here, zero, dot, dot, no, that's not gonna help me, fine. My a equals um, 10 to 20 say A, right? Like so. Um, if I wanted to say them all one on each line, then I would do um, say 4A, something like that. Now, uh, there's a way, because it's uh, an array, I can use the hyper operator to do something on all of them at once. Is that gonna work? Nope, that works. Post, circum uh, post, uh, post increment. So I got back all of the values of A before incrementing them, and then when I say A, it incremented them, right? You can do that with method calls too. So um, if I want to go through and do a method call um, on A, and that's probably what I should have done to begin with. What's a good method call on ints? Say. Oh, actually, <laughs> well, yeah, but um, um, say A uh, dot dot, um, I can never remember the darn syntax. Is prime perfect? Uh, hyphen. I'm sorry. What? Hyphen after is. There's a hyphen in there. I hate yes. hyphens. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So that did all of them, right? So now we can find out the primes very easily. Prime was an excellent example. Um, so uh, let's say that we want to say all of them shorter. Then you should be able to do. Um, like that, right? Instead of the other loop that I had before, you should be able to do that, but you aren't guaranteed the order of execution. So early versions of Rakuto would just do it, you know, they weren't gonna be optimized or parallelized, so it would just start at the beginning and go to the end and uh, do the, um, and do the say or do whatever method you wanted in order, and people started relying on that and I said it's bad, so now it actually randomizes it. Um, the Cheater. randomizer, yes. <laughs> Correct, because the results of the hyper are in the same order that they would have been had you done it sequentially. That's not a side effect, right? There it evaluated is prime and it got the results back in some random order, but then it put them back in the order that it would have been had it been sequentially. So thank you for making that point. So the point that was made is that uh, when I did is prime, these actually came back in order. 11's prime, 12 is not, 13's prime, and so forth. And that's correct because the hypers return the results in the correct order. In this case, I told the operation to be performed with say, and it has a side effect of outputting something to the screen. Um, in fact, if you uh, do like this, Right? Then it's going to do say on each one and then say the results, which is probably just going to be a bunch of trues, right? Okay? But you can see that the operation itself did one thing and the results that we printed out did another thing. And the trues are in order. That's correct. The trues are in order. True. <laughs> True. If you say so. <laughs> uh, pretty substandard randomness. Oh, I'm sorry. It, all I need it to be is in an, um, an unpredictable order. Um, we did actually do it completely random at one point, and the problem was is the randomness was slowing it down, which meant that hyper operators were actually slower than doing it sequentially. And that was bad, because <laughs> then people won't use them, and that's not the idiom we want to encourage. So. Um, I switched it so that it does them in reverse order, starting with the last element, doing every other element. I came up with a better algorithm this morning while preparing for the uh, talk and thinking about it. And so there's going to be a more randomized version. But you also don't want to lose locality. You'd like to keep locality so you're not doing cache things all over the place. You'd, you'd like to do elements close to each other, close to each other. So we'll, we'll do some of that. Okay, um, so that's hyper. Now, if you want everything to be processed as fast as possible and you don't care what order the results are in when you're done, then there's race. 
And so here is Map, Eager, and Hyper, and with Race, the generators are evaluated in any order, and they can be threaded, and the results can come back in any order. So if you say race, then this closure will be executed for all of the elements of data just as fast as the optimizer wants to do them, in whatever order it wants to do them. And when the results come back, it doesn't bother with the reordering. It just says, oh, you got this result, you got this one, you got this one, you got that failure over here, or whatever it may happen to be. And it just does everything as fast as it can. It's a primitive for doing map reduce. Okay, so, oh, I was wrong. Apparently this one's in Synopsys 2 also. So, so far we're in two, two and nine and six, right? Okay. Any question on the eager, hyper, and race? Yeah. Uh, I have a question here and then a question here. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. This is related slightly to um, the, the slide before going through all of these. What happens um, with the laziness if the data that's going into the lazy lists um, gets modified before the execution of the result or where the resulting list asks for that? So the question is, I know you're in the microphone, but the question is what happens if the values of data um, are modified somehow before this is processed, that particular data? And the answer is that if you rely on whatever behavior you get, it's wrong. So you're not supposed to rely on lazy side effects for a given behavior. Is that right, Larry? Is that still yeah. the case? It's yeah. Not, it's not going to try to enforce it. Right. Yeah. Right. And then I had another question over here. Yes? Um, there is, um, for yes, for all of these, uh, there is a notion of infinity and infinite lists. So the question is, is there any detection of infinite lists? And there is a notion of detection for infinite lists, but um, uh, it's still it, slushy. It doesn't go through map yet. <laughs> it doesn't go through map yet. And I, I, I've thought about it, and so far I had thought not putting it through map, but after seeing several examples over the last few days, I'm kind of thinking infinity should be transitive through map. So that if you're doing a map of an infinite list, then the map reports back, I'm probably infinite. Um, but we'll have to see what the side effects are on that. Um, if an eager hyper or race detects that something is definitely infinite, then it will halt and fail or throw an exception of some sort. Because it will say, I can't be eager because we'll sit here for a long time. <laughs> and you'll probably run out of memory. <laughs> and, and hyper and race are variants of eager. Are very eager, okay. Okay, any other questions on those? I have about five minutes left. That's gonna be about right. Um, there is, so if you wanna do your own threads, if you wanna do your own parallelism and not rely on the constructs that uh, we've already shown, there's an async um, prefix. And the async prefix causes a block to be invoked in its own thread. So if you say my thread equals async whatever, then the whatever that's uh, inside the curly is to do something there, that's going to be started off in its own independent thread. And this is where the slush level increases <laughs> in the spec. Um, so uh, there are uh, designated methods that will enable the thread to be suspended, to rejoin when a thread is finished, things like that. And it's kind of hand wavy. Uh, we think this will be here. Some sections even say, this is how it's going to work. And then it says, XXX, explain how this is going to really work. <laughs> and things like that. Um, so, and a lot of it came out of the Pugs project from uh, 2005 and 2006. Um, where there were some preliminary designs from Pugs on what should parallel, parallelism wor look like, how should it work. Uh, and there, so there's been several starts at things to do this. Uh, some of the decisions that were documented in the, in the synopses, which may or may not be true today, um, is that it was going to be more of a, a, a 5.005 threads model than an iThreads model. I have no clue what that means. Um, that I kind of do, but. If you ask me anything details, I'm not gonna be able to tell you. I will delegate to someone else and run away. Um, uh, the 
the, all the variables in scope will be shareable. Uh, it will do some introspection or it will look to try and make sure that those things that are being shared are being properly protected in a transactional way. Um, this is an area where we need a lot more exploration from use cases. We need to see what code looks like or should look like. You know, from people who want to write this, write examples. From examples, we can then begin to see where the holes are or where things will begin to work. And we need more implementations. Uh, I think except for pugs and maybe Nietzsche, there aren't really any implementations that, that have done anything with, with threads here. Um, similar ideas, now the slush level goes way up. Um, uh, you can put traits on blocks and subs. So if you put an is critical trait on a sub, then that means when this sub is doing, nothing else should go on. Or it shouldn't be interrupted, right? It needs to be there. There's an is atomic trait that says that a block um, is not to perform a irreversible action. So you don't want to output to a file or do something that's irreversible. Um, there were some uh, software transactional memory uh, ideas that were uh, put forth a few years ago. So there are different prefixes that you can put on statements and blocks. So you can have a contend prefix that says, um, I'm going to uh, allow this to be done and things can be done in parallel, but I want to have checkpoints in there where I can roll back the checkpoint if I need to and, uh, and pretend like it never even happened, uh, sorts of things. You can mark things as, uh, you know, maybe it's this, or maybe it's this, or maybe it's this. Go try them all and figure it out, stuff like that. Um, this is an area where we need a lot more examples and exploration and implementations. And examples, for me at least, have been what have driven the specification. So all of this is documented in Synopsis 17. Um, then we go to event handling. Uh, you know, events are definitely something that could be done in parallel fashion to be able to do things. And there's not much listed about event handling that I found in the synopses yet. Um, some modules, however, have experimented with different types of event loops and message queues and things um, like that. And the reports back from what I've seen on, on the IRC channel and other places is that multi-method dispatch is really nice here and being able to do pattern matching. And by pattern matching, I don't mean just regular, express, regular expressions, but smart matching. Um, you can uh, do a lot of dispatch where your events go magically to the places you want them to do with some really nice looking code. Um, but this is an area where we need a lot more exploration and implementations. And as far as I could tell, it wasn't in any synopses yet. Um, uh, certainly somebody who wants to start to draft a synopsis uh, you would be encouraged to do so or, you know, come up with text that you think ought to go there. We may say, no, it can't happen because of all of these other things, but at least it will start the conversations. We could look at actor models like Mo is doing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So things like actor models and the like. So uh, it's not in any synopses yet, so write some modules and show us how they ought to work. So uh, in summary, uh, parallelism in Perl 6 even though you can't go one place, apparently, to find out all the places or that has been thought about, um, it's there. And it's there in ways that when you go and, or at least for me, who I'm not normally thinking parallelizable, um, when I go and see the hyper operators, or I go and see things like um, hyper and, and junctions and things like that, I'm, I'm not instantly thinking of them for their parallel characteristics. I'm thinking of them because they make my job as a programmer easier. And the fact that they end up being parallel is a bonus for, for you know, both of us. And so the language attempts to provide an uh, easy way to, to ex express inherent parallelism. It tends to encourage the inherent parallelism that might be in your thing. And it, the language avoids things uh, avoids having you do things that would prevent parallelism from being a valid choice. Uh, there's many, many areas already, and this is the same list we've just gone through. Um, from an implementation perspective, uh, Rakuto, of course, up until very recently, within the last few weeks, has been almost entirely dependent on Parrot. And Parrot has had several threading implementations, but we haven't been able to do that. That's changing now. Um, Rakuto is going to be on the JVM very, very soon now. And the JVM, uh, Java Virtual Machine, of course, threading has been an integral part of Java for a long time. So it's a very mature type of system. And when you're trying to explore threading, it's nice to have at least something that's mature. <laughs> 
that you can kind of anchor to when you're exploring so that you're not constantly saying, well, this didn't work out. Is that because my virtual machine threads aren't doing the right thing or is it because the Recudo stuff's not doing the right thing? At least we can know uh, with some certainty what's happening in the Java virtual machine when it's doing threads and then we can build from there. And again, as I said, it needs more exploration in general. And so with that, I'll take questions for the uh, zero minutes I have left, but I'll take a couple of questions. Yes. Very cool. So the comment was uh, that the Postgres folks are doing a lot of stuff with parallelism from natural constructs like sorting and selecting where it finds ways to make that parallel. So good, thank you. Uh, right, Rainy? So uh, the comment was that uh, in Lisp they're doing it where you can parallelize the evaluation of arguments um, to things that are doing. Perl 6 actually has that. I didn't put it in my talk. But for the feed operators and for things that are slurpy uh, parameters, those are allowed to be evaluated in parallel, uh, even though it's lazy. Um, and then I have one from Liz. And then I'll do chip, and then I'll take any other questions out in the hallway. Liz. So uh, the comment is that uh, classify and categorize in Perl 6 could be parallelizable, and I suspect that's probably true. Um, especially things dealing with hash-like things, hashes are naturally eager, so they're often naturally parallelizable. So I would agree with that. Yeah, we need to find ways of, of sending the race signal up, upstream. Uh, I think of it as downstream. But well, yeah, what? <laughs> I think of it as metaphors downstream. we live top by. Down. Yes, it's it's the reverse of of the context yeah. thing. But I, in in putting this talk together, all of a sudden a few pieces fell into place for me, which is the other reason to do it, where I can say, oh, that's how I can do hyper and eager and race in the list reimplementation. So I'm good with that. And then Chip. Absolutely. And so I was wondering how much freedom you feel at the language level to say when something becomes that parallel, rather than say, oh, locks will automatically be installed, and instead say, no, you're not allowed to do that. We can somehow restrict one thread from trying to reference the unsafe data. Of the other. OK, so the question, I, if I think I understand it, is that uh, whenever you start doing things on uh, um, multiple threads in an operating system, you always have to deal with um, shared data and putting locks around it. And uh, so, Chip, I understand your, qu your question was, um, as opposed to saying you must lock and perform, do you have the option of saying I can't do it or I shouldn't do it or things like that? So um, the question is, uh, how comfortable from a language design perspective would we be with telling the user that uh, um, you, that you can't touch the data because it's private or it's often another thread? Yeah, and can I I'm answer that as Larry? A, um, yeah, my preference, of course, always is to not do that as as a Perl language designer to tell people that can't do something. You can't. <laughs> 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 There's lots of things I could tell you not to do. Yeah, yeah, um, but this this is this intermediate level um, was low, which we categorize as, as 
you know, low-level-ish locking, um, is an area where, where STM, software transactional memory, is designed to scale up better than, um, you know, hard locks or, you know, you can't do that. So it's possible that, I mean, STM is, is a bit of a toy, but on that level it actually works pretty well uh, for um, getting out of your face as a programmer. So maybe that maybe that's an answer there. Maybe it isn't. More exploration is needed. I don't want to give up on it until it's been tried. Uh, th I mean, and that's yeah. That you know, I don't want it to say, oh, it looks like it'll be really hard or whatever. Well, for parallelism and a lot of things in Perl six, but especially this, I don't want it to carve out entire sections of the search space just because we don't know how to do them. Let's the, try them. The saying, he, he didn't know it was impossible, so he did it anyway. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I felt about the regex engine, by the way. <laughs> when I first looked at the doing the regex engine and had to implement it, my first thought when I read Synopsis 5 was this was impossible. Uh, but I had enough faith in Larry and Damien that they weren't completely smoking crack. So I said, <laughs> I was, said maybe it really is possible. And I said, I'm going to try it anyway, even though every bone in my body says it can't be done. And it worked out. So who knows? All right. Well, thank you all very much.